Hello and welcome everybody to the 2021 K-State Garden Hour Winter Series. If this is your first time with us, welcome. If you're a regular, we're so happy that you're back and are joining us again. This webinar series started in the spring of 2020 as a hope to share extension gardening education during the height of the pandemic. With much success, we have reached over 10,000 garden enthusiasts just like you. This webinar is hosted by K-State Research and Extension. My name is Kelsey Hattisall and I am the horticulture agent for the River Valley District. Everybody involved in the development of this series is an, is an extension professional for K-State. Most of us have a background in horticulture education or a related discipline, but most of all, we have a love for educating and, and sharing our love for gardening. Before we get started, we do have a couple housekeeping notes to cover. Please use the Q&A feature for any questions related to this presentation. You should be able to find that button along the bottom at the tab that says Q&A. Please ask the questions there as that's where we will look for them after the presentation. Our moderators today are Cassie Homan and Franny Miller. They will be sharing information throughout the presentation in the chat box. They are here to also help facilitate the question and answer portion after our presentation. Today's webinar will be recorded and it will be posted to the K-State Garden Hour website. We typically upload additional resources related to each topic as well. If you, if we have, <laughs> sorry, if you have any questions about any topics that we've covered, please visit the K-State Garden Hour as they have a list of the previous topics and upcoming topics. Today's topic is Embrace Your Landscape's Wild Side, Supporting Backyard Birds. I'm pleased to introduce to you our speaker today, Mr. Chuck Audie. He is an extension agent in Geary County. Chuck is a lifelong birder and has an avid backyard bird feeder and bird watcher. So please give us a few minutes to transition here and we'll turn it over to Chuck. All right, thank you, Kelsey. And I think we're up and going and ready to go this, this afternoon. Um, good afternoon. And I would encourage you to just, if, if I say something, you see something on a slide that triggers a question, Boy, go to that Q&A and just write it down right now. I know I'm to the stage where about 30 seconds after I think of the question, it's gone. So write it down while you're thinking about it. And hopefully I'll be leaving enough time at the end of the program that we will be able to, to ca catch most of those questions um, at the end. So supporting backyard birds, wintertime bird feeding. Here it is early October. Migration is well underway um, over the past week. The, the dark-eyed juncos have started coming back into the state, and those are one of the one of the earliest returning of our winter birds. So it's time. It's time to start getting out there, getting your bird feeders cleaned and filled, and let's start talking about that. Birds are just like you and me. They have needs. In fact, they have the same basic needs as you and me. They need food. They need water. They need shelter. Plain and simple. They need cover or shelter from weather and predators. They need safe resting and roosting areas. And, you know, six months from now, they're going to need nesting and broodering areas. So they have the same basic needs as you and me. If we put these into the order of importance, Chuck's view in this, probably the most important thing is cover. So many residents in, in Kansas and around the country live in what I will call the urban and suburban desert. Just, I mean, there's just not the landscaping that's being needed. Water is number two. Everybody feeds, but let's face it, it can get cold in Kansas, it can get dry in Kansas. Think about last February when it was down below zero for a couple of days on end. Open water can be very hard to find. Then lastly, food. Give them what they want, where they want it. We're going to go into a lot of detail on that because birds are just like people. It's presentation, it's, it's what, you know, give them what they want, present it like they want it. If you look at the, the two pictures on the bottom of your screen, um, we've got two examples. I will guarantee you that the backyard landscape on the, in the right-hand picture is going to attract a lot more birds than the landscape on the left. It's just birds want trees, they need shrubs, they need safe ways to get to where the food is. Some basic principles, and I can do an entire hour program on landscaping for wildlife, landscaping for birds, but in smaller urban lots and to a lesser extent in larger lots, put large trees on the perimeter, put smaller trees and shrubs closer to the house. Birds don't come in at 500 feet altitude and just drop down to your feeders. They go to the tops of the trees and they start working their way down. They're cautious. They have to be cautious 
to survive. So we want to make sure that they have ways to stair step down to where the feeders are. I call these safe travel lanes. So select a series of landscape plants for both shelter, for cover, and for food. We've got a lot of things that will work good for that. Um, threats. We have some basic threats. We have terrestrial threats and we have aerial threats to birds. Terrestrial threats are going to be cats and snakes. Snakes are going dormant here pretty soon, so it's going to be mainly cats during the wintertime. Aerial based are going to be those birds of prey, those little hawks that make a, make a living at our bird feeders. You need to provide protection and escape from both. Now, birds have alarm calls, and it appears that these alarm calls go across species. So if a cardinal makes an alarm call, the sparrows, the goldfinches, the blue jays all recognize that. There also seems to be some evidence that the alarm call is specific for a ground-based threat or an aerial-based threat. And if you watch how they react, if everything goes straight up, they're getting off the ground. It's a ground-based threat. If they dive into thick cover, it's probably a bird of prey. Uh, I have found that evergreens make good windbreaks on the north and west. They also make good cover close to the feeders. Management practices. Please don't be an obsessive compulsive fall garden cleaner. I'm a gardener. I am like that. You've got to get it all tidied up in the fall. Well, there's actually a lot of this stuff that we can wait until spring. Some fall cleanup is necessary, but delay as much as you can well into the spring. Many species depend on all that debris that's in our gardens. Um, a lot of the goldfinches, a lot of the small songbirds will feed on a lot of the seeds that are in chrysanthemums and, and other flowering species that we didn't deadhead at the end of the season. So try to leave as much of that stuff as long into the spring as possible. Here's a picture from backyard when I, when I lived in, in Junction City. You can see in the background, I've got some larger trees. I've got an arborvita next to an apple tree on the deck. And I've got a red, but I've got boxwood. I've got last year's Christmas tree. And judging by the amount of green that's still in that, this picture was probably taken in January or February. There's a lot of places where the birds can step their way down to the feeders. There, there's a couple feeders here. There's a feeder there. There's a feeder there. Ways that they can get down safely and then get back up into cover if they need to. So think about having these multiple options of where birds can go. If you go to my house today, I still have last year's Christmas tree sitting by the bird feeders and it will be there until this year's Christmas tree goes out the door on January 1st. So don't just trash that Christmas tree if you use a real Christmas tree. Water, open water in the wintertime is so critical. There's, there's multiple good bird bath heaters. Um, a lot of them, like the one I show here, uh, it has a thermostat in it. So if it's a warm day, if the water is getting up to 45 degrees on its own, it shuts off. It doesn't use electricity. Not only is water necessary for the seed eating species in the wintertime, but it will also bring in things like Eastern bluebirds and American robins and cedar waxwings birds that do not eat our normal bird seed that we put out. They're going to be eating the juniper berries. They're going to be eating the, the, the crab apples that are still out there, but they need water. So that will bring in a lot of these non-seed eating birds that are actually quite beautiful to look at. Food, give them what they want, where they want it. You can find a plethora of, of feeders out there. You can find hanging feeders, ground feeders, tube feeders, sack feeders, troughs, trays, just all sorts of different feeders. You know, most people are going to start with a hanging feeder, maybe a tube feeder with some thistle seed or sunflower chips in, in it. And most of my feeders, in fact, all but one of my feeders are hanging feeders. Um, then I have one that's basically just a wooden trough on the ground. And I put that down there for the, for the sparrows, the juncos, the, those species that prefer to feed on the ground. And this concept of where birds prefer to feed and the kind of feed you put in that feeder is very important. There are basically, we can take all the things that we feed to birds and break them into two groups for the most part at the wintertime. Oil seeds and soot. These are high fat, often high protein, things like sunflower, safflower, the niger thistle, peanuts. Um, and then we have grains, high carbohydrate, low fat, much lower protein than the oil seeds. This is going to be millet, mylor sorghum, corn, wheat, oats. Oil seeds and soots should be in raised or hanging feeders. Grains should be in ground feeders. So if you're feeding a mix, it probably needs to be in the ground feeder. 
if you put that mix that's going to be primarily grains, a lot of millet, milo, corn, few sunflower seeds, if you put that into a raised or hanging feeder, the birds are going to come in there and they're going to start tossing out all the grain trying to get to the sunflower seeds. That's why they do it. Now, once that grain hits the ground, the juncos, the sparrows, um, the other ground feeding species will make use of it. But you'll eliminate a lot of that waste that I hear a lot of backyard bird feeders complain about by simply filling that hanging feeder with sunflower seed only. Um, oil seeds on the ground will be consumed by almost any species. Sunflower seeds, everybody likes sunflower seeds. Northern Cardinal, probably one of the most preferred birds that people want to have at their feeders in the winter time. And, and why not? That bright red coloration. Um, uh, cardinals are going to like oil seeds and they will go to hanging feeders first. They will also feed on the ground. Cardinals are also going to be first at the feeders in the morning and last at the feeders in the evening. I cannot tell you why, but that's the way they do things. Sunflowers, black oil sunflowers. And you kind of sometimes need to pay attention there. Most of the time we see black oil sunflower when they're talking about sunflower seed. It is an oil seed. In studies done by Fish and Wildlife Service back in the 90s where they put all these different feeders, feeds into all these different feeders all across the country. And then they had people watch them and record who was eating what. Black oil sunflower was the preferred food for most all species. Razor hanging feeders, finches, and that includes gold finches, house finches, pine siskins, jays, woodpeckers, all really go after the sunflower seeds. There's other, there's black striped sunflower seeds and gray striped sunflower seeds. These are confectionery sunflowers. They are less preferred. They will still be eaten, but the seed, the, the, the seed is larger. It's a little bit harder for some of the smaller birds to handle it. The black oil sunflower is where you want to really concentrate your efforts. Then we have the tufted titmouse, more common in eastern Kansas than western Kansas. In fact, you get past about Salina and Wichita, and they become fairly uncommon. But um, they're an oil seed. They want it in a hanging feeder. They're going to dash in, grab a seed, and dash back out to go sit up in a tree or some place where they feel safe to crack that shell open. Um, but again, an oil seed feeder, an oil seed preference, put it in the hanging feeders. White proso millet. In the studies that I mentioned earlier with the Fish and Wildlife Service, white proso millet, which is a grain, um, was the second most preferred food of all species. Put it on the ground or the low raised feeders, juncos, doves, all the sparrows, and I mean real sparrows. And I'll show you a picture here pretty soon, not just house sparrows. Uh, I used to think that that stuff, first of all, my mom and I were putting it in the hanging feeder, which was a mistake. And then it just got thrown on the ground. And I thought it was wasted because I just see all the seeds down there on the ground. But once I started looking at it closer, what I realized was the birds were popping the, the shell off the outside of that seed, which was just a little white thing, and then they were eating the actual grain itself. So don't think that just because you're seeing these little shells all around, they're not eating the grain. They are eating the grain. These are some of our co more common winter, winter sparrows, what I call the real sparrows. Uh, the Harris sparrow on the upper lap, left the white crown sparrow on the upper right, the fox sparrow on the lower right, and of course the junco, sometimes called snowbirds, on the lower left. All of these are going to do 99% of their feeding on the ground. They want to scratch around. They want to pick things up. Um, so, so that's where you want to focus and put your grains. Put it on the ground for the birds like these. Yeah, the house sparrows, which are a European species, are going to come in and eat that too. That's okay, but these guys will be there as well. Now, safflower excuse me, safflower is, is basically, it looks like a small white sunflower seed. It's got the same basic shape. It's an oil seed. Uh, it's about two thirds of size, usually a black oil sunflower seed. It's somewhat less preferred than sunflower, but cardinals and house finches really seem to like it. One of the things that we have noticed over the years is that squirrels seem to not care for safflower seed. So if you're having troubles with squirrels really raiding your bird feeders, and I'll talk a little bit more about squirrels later, try switching to safflower. Used to be hard to find safflower. Just about anywhere that carries bird seed now is going to have safflower. A little bit more expensive, but if you've got a real squirrel issue, it may be worth trying. Uh, use it in the hanging or raised feeders. Don't put it on the ground. Here we have the house finch on the upper left and the purple finch on the lower right. 
Um, could go into a long story about house finches, but house finches just arrived in Kansas permanently in the 1980s. They're here year round. Purple finches are a nomadic species. Some winters we have a lot, some we don't have very many at all. Um, but they, they have, purple finches have always been here. House finches moved in from the east and the west coast. So at this time of year, you're probably still seeing house finches. You will continue to see them all winter long. Uh, purple finches may show up. Last year was a pretty good year for them. And for me, the easiest way to tell the difference, especially on the males, is to look at the striping under the wing here along the, the flanks. And with house finches, it's going to be very prominent and it's going to be primarily brown. With purple finches, that striping on the sides is quite diffused. Don't waste time trying to, gee, is it more rosy colored or more red colored or purple colored? Or, just look at the striping. House finches, purple finches are both going to eat at either a ground or a raised feeder. They really prefer the oil seeds, but they will eat the grains as well. Females look substantially different. And for most of us, the females are easier to tell apart than the males. The house finch, female house finch is in the upper left. Female purple finch is in the lower right. And be sure to notice this real strong white eyebrow here. That's a good way to, to pick out the female purple finch. Again, primarily oil seeds, either a raised or, or a ground feeder. Niger thistle um, is not a thistle as we think of thistles in Kansas. Um, it, it is, it's grown over, it's grown in tropical regions. Um, I call it black gold because it is rather pricey. You'll want to use it in a tube feeder that's got those narrow little slit openings. House finches love niger thistle. And if you put it in just a standard tube feeder with the circular openings, the house finches will drain that sucker in a day. So with the, with the slit openings, their beaks are just a little bit too wide. The goldfinches, the pine siskins can get in there and get that out very easily. Um, the house finches cannot. The thing about niger thistle is it goes rancid quickly. Unless you, if you had some from last spring that you're going to start using this fall, unless you put it in the freezer and kept it in the freezer all winter, I would dump it on the ground and go out and buy, buy fresh. I also encourage you to look closely at those bags because most companies now, when they bag up bird seed, will put a date on it of, of you know, packaged in 2021 for the, you know, for the winter of 2021, something like that. They'll have some kind of date on it. I have been in stores and have seen bird seed that's as much as two years old. Um, get away from it. A lot of us have pretty well quit feeding thistle. We've gone to feeding the, the, um, the pre-hulled sunflower seeds and chips. Seems to be a lot less expensive and it doesn't go rancid nearly as quickly. Here we see the little goldfinch, the male on the left, the female on the right, um, and, and the goldfinches are, are losing that, the male goldfinches are losing that bright yellow color right now. Uh, they'll become, the males will start to look a lot more like this bird on the right as we move further into wintertime. And then about February or March, you'll start to see them getting those blotches of bright yellow back as they start to get, get into their um, breeding time plumage. Pine siskin is closely related to the to the goldfinches. It's a smaller bird, a smaller beak, real fine streaking on it. Uh, this yellow on the edge of the tail and on the wings is very, very obvious, but it's, I mean, it's smaller even than a goldfinch. It's another species that some years we'll see a lot of them in the winter, some years we won't see any. We had quite a few last year. Don't know what we'll see this winter. We'll just have to wait and see. But both the goldfinches and the siskins, they want oil seeds, they want those sunflower seeds, sunflower chips, they want it at a hanging feeder. Soot. Soot is a form of animal fat that's been processed down. It's very good source of energy. Um, woodpeckers go after it. I feed a season round soot all year. Um, woodpeckers, chickadees, nuthatches, brown creepers, starlings can also like it and that can sometimes be a problem. It can be fed raw, it can be rendered, can be mixed with various seeds or peanut butter to make it usable throughout the year. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you have a peanut allergy, avoid those that, that have peanut butter in, but they have some that have cornmeal as well. So that's an option also. Uh, this is an example of a soot cake that you can buy in a store. You can buy raw soot and render it down yourself. It stinks. I just wouldn't even try it. The, the, the soot cakes in the stores are usually fairly economical. I'm going to show you some of the woodpeckers we have. These pictures are not to scale. Bird on the right is one of our more common woodpeckers, the red-bellied woodpecker. 
The bird on the left is a yellow-bellied sapsucker. Red-bellied woodpeckers are here year round. Yellow-bellied sapsuckers are just getting into the state now and they'll be here until late March, early April. The little picture down here shows you wh where they get their name. Sapsuckers actually do eat the sap. They, they drill these little holes in trees. Sap oozes out. Insects get caught in the sap um, and they'll pick the insects out of that too. Homeowners will see these on things like young trees with thin bark or on fruit trees and get very concerned. The trees usually heal them over in one or two seasons. It's nothing to worry about. Uh, in reality, the yellow-bellied sapsucker is probably about half to two-thirds the size of the red-bellied woodpecker. The other two common woodpeckers are the hairy woodpecker on the left, the downy on the right. If you have the two of them together, the downy is only half the size. You usually don't have two of them together at your feeder. So you go, well, which one do I have? I always tell people, don't try to guess the size of the bird. Look at the beak. The downy just has this bitty little beak. I'll just even question whether it should be called a woodpecker. It is a true woodpecker. I'm just kidding. Uh, the hairy woodpecker has a much larger woodpecker looking like beak. So these are both birds that are all across the, the state. Downies are far more common. Hairies like heavier timber. Oh, and the nuthatches, a couple of my favorites. The red-breasted nuthatch on the upper right, white-breasted on the lower left. White-breasted nuthatches are a nesting species in Kansas. They are here year-round. Red-breasted nuthatches, again, one of those eruptive species, kind of nomadic at times. Um, they've started showing up across the state in the past two weeks. So be on the lookout for them. If, they, if they've got a, a strong, obvious white eyebrow with a black line through, through the eye, then you've got a red-breasted. Some of the white-breasted nuthatches can kind of have a, a, a blush here on, you know, kind of a pinkish blush on the side. But, you know, notice that the white is totally surrounded, the eye is totally surrounded by white. So they're going to go after soot. They're going to go after the oil seeds. Another bird that's kind of like the titmice, they fly in, grab a seed, fly out, fly in, grab a seed, fly out. Sometimes they're feeding on it. Sometimes they're just caching it behind the bark of trees so they can get to it later. Mixes. A lot of people buy the mixes and a lot of them are cheap mixes. The example shown here is actually a high quality mix. It's primarily oil seeds. It's got black oil, it's got safflower, it's got chips, it's got some peanuts in there, not a lot of grain. Um, and, and if you wanna buy a mix, you wanna get something like that. Most of the mixes you find are gonna be the cheapest seed there per pound at, at the store but they're gonna have a lot of grain in them, a lot of millet, a lot of cracked corn, a lot of milo. You know, if you wanna get one of those, that's fine, feed it on the ground. And just, you'll, you'll waste less feed, you'll have better success if you just put the straight black oil sunflower in, in a hanging feeder. And the chickadees, popular little bird. We actually have two species of chickadees in, in Kansas. The black capped chickadee is across most of the state. Um, the Carolina chickadee is on the lower right, and it is found primarily just along some of the counties along the Oklahoma border, over towards about Meade County is about it, from, from Cherokee County over to Meade County. Um, don't worry too much. There's ways to tell them apart, both by call and, and some visual characteristics. You can call it a chickadee and just not worry about it. They're going to like the oil seeds. They're going to like the hanging feeders. Chickadees in the bird world are the early warning system. Um, they're, they're local birds. They're always around. They're looking around. They're that nosy neighbor that knows what everybody else is doing. So when other birds are migrating through like warblers and vireos in September and early October or again in the spring, they'll hang out with a chickadee if they're on, in feeding because the chickadees will be paying attention. And if there is any kind of a threat, they'll sound the alarm. The warblers, the vireos don't have to pay such close attention then and can concentrate on refueling and storing up fat so they can take the next leg of the migration. So chickadees are always in motion. They're always moving. They're always talking. A lot of fun to watch them. Over the past couple of years, have started to get a lot of interesting questions come in. Um, part of it about possible bird feeds. Oats in bacon grease was a popular one, has been a popular one on social media the past couple of years. People have asked me about, is it okay to, to feed bread, bread crumbs, cube breads, dried bread, whatever, stale or not? And how about rice? People are concerned about throwing rice at weddings and things like that. So are any of these really a problem? Okay, let's look at that. Here's a couple of tables that show 
some of our common bird feeds and some of these questionable products, let's say. Sunflower seeds, 14% protein, 33% fat. Safflower, 11% protein, 25% fat. And go on down. A common seed mix, a lot more grains in there. 8% protein, 3% fat. Then we get down to the soot cake. Not a lot of protein, 4%, but a lot of fat. And the same thing with the seed cakes. Those are the ones that are held together by, you know, syrup and other, other such things. You can see that as we go down there, you can see why certain birds are going to prefer certain ones. So now, now let's compare some of these others. Sunflower, put sunflower there in that second table um, right here. And then raw oatmeal is about 12% protein and 6% fat. So yeah, it's got some protein, not a lot of fat. It's going to be somewhat similar to the seed mix there. Raw rice, 7% protein, 0% fat. Bread has 9% protein, 4% fat. Now, you may not realize it, but every bag of bird feed nowadays has a nutrition label on it, just like human foods. Uh, I had to do a little bit of work on some of these down here to get that converted from, you know, gr grams per serving, whatever, to 2%, but, but that's how that works out. So a lot of these things like the rice, like the bread, don't really do a lot for the nutrition of the birds. It's almost like the celery diet for humans. Yeah, it may fill them up, but is it really going to give them what they need? I think about the rice, the, the bread down here, just not, just not what they really need. Now, let's go to the other one that was, you know, oats in basically taking oatmeal, soaking in the, in the bacon grease. Well, the bacon grease is obviously going to have a lot of fat in it. That's what it is. So it's going to give, give you that. And let's face it, I'd eat bacon three meals a day. But it's not advisable just because we like it. And think of the hummingbirds that are just about out of the state now. Hummingbirds, they hit that sh sugar water, that nectar. But they also have to have protein. So they eat insects. Bacon grease or any cooking oil, it's exposed to high temperatures. And products in something in bacon like nitrosamines will be present and their impact is unknown for birds. Just like we're still not sure what that stuff does to human bodies, you know, we're not sure. Soot, yes, soot is a form of animal fat, but when soot is rendered down to make those seed cakes, it's done so at very low heat, usually at 160 to 180 degrees. So it's not 325 to 400 degrees that we're frying bacon at. If we go back to, you know, raw oatmeal and bacon, I just don't think that is a good idea. The raw rice, the raw bread, yeah, that's getting a little bit of nutrition out of them, out of it for the birds, but there's a lot better choices up here. Will the rice, the people throw at weddings, hurt the birds? No, it's not going to hurt them. It's not going to help them either. Problems. I'm just going to go through a whole bunch of problems now because that's what I always seem to get questions on. People will call me a lot of times from now until about Christmas time about saying, I've got the bird feeders out. I've got fresh bird feed. I've got no birds of the feeders. What has happened to the birds? There's been a lot in the, in the mainstream media the past couple of years about the decline in the number of bird species out there. So people have this heightened awareness that, oh no, something's wrong. We had a massive die off. Um, most of what we find, though, is simply weather-related and natural food availability. Haven't had a frost yet in the state. I don't think we had any out in northwest Kansas yet. Um, but there's a lot of natural food out there. Things like ragweed, kochia, lamb's quarter, pigweed, even wild hemp. These are plants that produce lots and lots of hard little seed that's fairly high in protein and fat. If, they, if those birds can get to it, that's fine. As the juncos, the sparrows, as these birds start to move back in, they tend to be spread far and wide across, the, across the, an area. So they're feeding on the natural sources. Now, if you remember back a year ago in late March, uh, late, excuse me, late October, we had a little snowstorm, a couple, three inches across a lot of the state. Birds came flocking to my feeder while there was snow on the ground. Once the snow was gone, so were the birds because they're able to get back to those natural food sources. So we've got high natural seed base available right now. Do we have open water or do we have ice? If we've got a lot of cold weather, we've got a lot of ice, birds are more likely to be in the backyard. Are we having mild weather or harsh weather? Harsh weather is going to require the birds to eat a lot more. 
Um, do we have snow cover or no snow cover? If there's no snow cover, they can continue to look for those natural food sources. And then lastly, just normal cycles of movement. Birds move around in a large area. They don't just come to your backyard, whether you're in town or out in the country. You are one stop on a huge buffet line to the birds. So, you know, they're going to be moving around. They're going to, it's all about energy conservation. Where can they find the most available food for the least energy? That, that's what it all boils down to. Energy conservation is important with, for humans and our structures. It's important for, for all creatures out in the wild. Problems, cats. Current research from multiple choice sources are showing that cats currently are killing around 2.6 billion birds per year in the US and Canada. So outdoor cats are a real problem and keep in mind that the house cat is not native to the North American ecosystem. It's really tough to come up with effective um, deterrence. Some people say, put a bell on the cat. I've watched a cat stalk a bird and that bell didn't ring until it landed on the final pounce. Squirt guns, I've known people to use squirt guns. I've known people to use squirt guns with ammonia in them. I've known people and I'm not recommending it to use paintball guns. When that bird goes home, the owner realizes that cat was probably someplace it shouldn't be. Ultimately, the only answer to this is going to be keep the cat indoors. Um, I'm a cat lover. I love cats. They're amazing creatures. But the house cat was not native to North America. Birds of prey. Oh, yes. Um, this happened to be a picture my wife took of a Cooper's hawk that had just nailed a junco in our backyard. Well, my first thought is, hey, they're birds too. And it is a bird feeder, isn't it? It's a cycle. You're, everything out there in the natural world is, is number two on the food chain to something else. So it's going to happen. Yeah, if they just ate the starlings, the house sparrows would feel a lot better about it. Don't take my cardinals. Um, this comes that, back to where landscaping can really, really help. Give the birds escape routes. Give them places to go where they can get around and hide from those, from those birds of prey. Um, they're small birds, things with lots of stems. Uh, even uh, even deciduous things like spirea and lilac and forsythia, even though they don't have leaves on them in the wintertime, they've got a lot of stems that they can that those little birds can put between them and the hawk. Evergreens, the boxwood that I showed you there in the hedge along my deck when I lived in town. You know anything that's got cover on it that can provide protection. Birds are very birds of prey. Hawks have very acute eyesight, and they trigger on movement. So if you ever look outside and you see a bird, you know, you've seen a lot of birds at your feeders, the next time you look out, there's one lone goldfinch on the feeder and it's not moving. It isn't moving because it missed the alarm call and someplace in the neighborhood in your yard, more than likely, there is a bird of prey. If you walk outside, you can probably see it as long as that little goldfinch doesn't move, it's probably safe. The minute it moves, the hawk is going to see it and come after it. So give them some place to go. Other things I encourage people, I've talked about the cover, give them some shelters and protection. Bad feed, bad feed will happen with, with the niger thistle seed. Um, I, you know, I, I think the others are tend to have a lot more stability, cats or hawks in the neighborhood. Um, I encourage people to just hang up by the feeders and think like a bird. Birds can't use logic. They've got to use just reactions to move, to escape. So sometimes we don't realize what creatures outside of our house are hearing from our activities inside the house. It's amazing what just one, one covered door being allowed to kind of slam shut or a door being slammed shut. Just little things like that can really be amplified outside and is giving them a clue to they got to look out. Sometimes it may be out to get them. So just hang outside and be a bird brain for a while. Not the birds you want. This is a real common complaint that I get. Um, starlings, blue jays, house sparrows, grackles, red-winged blackbirds are all things that people say, I don't want them at my feeder. Well, what are you feeding and how are you feeding it? And just remember, you put out a buffet and everyone is liable to stop by. Um, sometimes if it gets really bad, especially with flocks of starlings in the wintertime, you may just have to take everything in for a couple of days until they disperse and go someplace else. Um, other times it's just put the feed that your preferred species want and put it out there. Blue jays are going to come and go. Uh, there, there's no question of that. House sparrows are always going to be around no matter what you do. 
grackles and red winged blackbirds tend to be more seasonal. Uh, they'll show up now and then they'll start showing up again in the spring. But um, starlings are probably going to be the biggest one. All you can do is just pull everything in and just realize what you're feeding and how you're feeding it. I've got to put up the Blue Jays too. You know, I, I live in, in Geary County and Junction City High School are the Blue Jays as their mascot. So I've always got to put up a Blue Jay. Blue Jays are related to crows and magpies and ravens. And that group, the Corvids, not the Covids, but the Corvids are considered by ornithologists to be the smartest of all birds. They, they can hide all sorts of, of food in places and go back and find 90% of it. Um, crows have been documented using tools to allow them to get to food that they couldn't get otherwise. So they're a very intelligent group of birds and the interactions and watching them sometimes can be entertaining as well. That's another thing that I like about backyard bird feeding. Backyard bird feeding may not help any single species survive the winter any better. It can hurt, it may not help but it allows us to get a better look at it and it brings them into closer to our realm and where families with young children or multi-generational, you know, grandpa, mom and dad, the kids can spend time on a cold snowy morning and watch the birds at the feeder. And it doesn't take a lot of expense. It's a, it's a neat way to interact with nature. Diseases, and we've got a lot of questions on this here recently because of the unknown disease that's killing um, songbirds in, in the Midwestern U.S., uh, and, and that hasn't occurred in Kansas as of yet. Um, birds are subject to many diseases, so it, it shouldn't be a surprise. Um, sanitation is critical, and I'm going to be more uh, conscientious this year than I usually am about periodically cleaning up underneath the feeder. Clean up those spilled seed, those hulls, all that stuff that tends to collect underneath there disinfect the the feeders with bleach and water and then sunshine sunshine ultraviolet light is a powerful disinfectant um, people say how do i clean up you know i've got it over grass over my landscape bed. how do i get all those seeds cleaned up well as long as it isn't wet go out there with the with the shop vac and you can clean up that stuff up pretty quickly either put it in a compost pile then or put it in in a trash bag and get rid of it um, I'm sure more than once my neighbors when I lived in town looked out the window and said, well, there's that Audi guy is vacuuming his lawn again, you know, so it, it's it may look weird, but it's a very effective way. One disease that we see regularly in Kansas is conjunctivitis, pink eye with house finches, especially uh, the eyes will get all crusty and they don't start flying away. And what happens is the conjunctivitis basically eventually blinds them, they can't see and they die. If this starts to happen, go through all that sanitation, pull in all the feeders, dump out all the seed. A lot of the diseases are what one friend of mine called fecal beagle. It comes from the droppings and then the birds pick it up as they're scratching around for, for food uh, in there. So just clean that stuff up, clean the, clean the feeders, you know, take them down for three, four or five days um, and then put it back out. Um, I wouldn't do this unless you see evidence of that. Last year, we had a little bit of a salmonella problem. Uh, another thing that it was hitting the goldfinches and the pine siskins. It was real bad in the Pacific Northwest. I had a couple pine siskins show up at my feeders. I thought, uh-oh, that's probably salmonella. Took everything down, cleaned it up for a week, put it back out, and that seemed to break the cycle. So if we can break the cycle, it really, really helps. Now, I also will occasionally, when I'm talking with people about this, get the response, well, if I take my feeders in, those birds are going to die. No, they're not. As I said earlier, your set of bird feeders is one stop on a large buffet line, whether you live in town or you live out in the country. They will find other food, food sources, they will survive, and when you put the feeders back out, they will return. So just take the time, think of the health and the well-being of the birds but first. Water, bleach, and sunshine are, are really the best way to clean this up. This is a trough feeder I used to use. Um, did a lot of little experiments with this, watching how squirrels reacted to different things. Um, but just periodically, clean all the seed out, dump it in the trash, clean it out, let it sit in the sunlight for a day. Works wonders for disinfecting. Problems. The squirrel. And here we see a squirrel with one hand holding onto the pole and one hand on the feeder and just going, yeah, you got a problem. Uh, squirrels probably be behind, right next to hawks are the number one problem I get asked about. Important thing to keep in mind is that 
red pepper, cayenne pepper, is a very effective deterrent. You're going to light that squirrel up. Squirrels have similar taste receptors, and other mammals for that matter, have similar taste receptors to what we have. The, the hot ingredient in that cayenne pepper and that red pepper, that capsaicin, will light them up too. Birds have diff different receptors in their mouth. They don't, the capsation doesn't treat them like it does to us. So they'll just keep on feeding it just fine. So if you've got squirrel problems, you can even buy pre-treated seed that has the capsation already on it, or you can just get the biggest jar of, of red pepper, cayenne pepper. Chili powder is not hot enough, so it needs to be red or cayenne pepper. And go out every day and just really, you know, treat the seed well. I will issue a word of warning that if you're doing this at the feeder, make sure you don't get a puff of wind in your face. It happened to me. I understand now why pepper spray works. So just be careful with that. Uh, and the other thing you can do, I mean, squirrels are going to defeat most any squirrel proof bird feeder. They do love corn. Put some ears of corn out there for a peace offering. Put them on a nail someplace so they can't haul it away. Um, you can get lag screws and hang it up in the tree. They'll get to it, but just offer them some corn as a peace offering. Cayenne pepper also works for raccoons. Raccoons are very destructive. I've gone through phases where I've had to bring in all my feeders every night because the raccoons would, would take them down, they'd open them, they'd break them, they'd eat, they just, they make a mess. Possums aren't destructive and in ways very, very good critters, um, but they're messy. They tend to defecate where they're feeding, so it can be a real mess. Skunks aren't usually feeding on the feed, they're feeding on the on the insects that are feeding on the spillage. More of a problem spring, summer, and fall than in winter. Uh, and rodents are going to be active year round. And if you've got a lot of spillage out there into the feeders, you're eventually going to have rats and mice coming to us. So get that cleaned up on a regular basis. I always like to encourage people, you put out a buffet and, and anything is liable to stop by. Two legs, four legs, six legs, eight legs, no legs. We narrow that down a little bit in the wintertime with primarily just two legs or four legs. If you don't want to see weird critters in your backyard, don't put out bird feed because it's, it's hard telling what you're going to get coming to your feeder. Final thought. You don't have to identify all the birds at your feeder. You don't have to identify any of the birds at your feeder. If you want to call a cardinal a red bird, knock yourself out. It doesn't bother me. If you want to call a goldfinch a wild canary, that's great. If they're bringing you joy and pleasure in watching them, that's all that really matters. If you want to learn more about the birds, there's a lot of groups out there that can help you learn. Kansas Ornithological Society, various Audubon chapters across the state. Um, I can even give you some references as well as things that will help you learn more about the birds. Here's my contact information. Feel free to email me. That's my office phone number. Um, and that ksbirds.org is a website that I maintain that's also the Kansas Ornithological Society. A lot of information about birds in Kansas. This last um, long URL there, uh, there's a series of eight backyard birding guides that I put together that covers a lot of the stuff we've covered today that covers hummingbird feeding, landscaping for birds, bird bird watching resources, including binoculars, bird books, and things like that. I've got eight of them there, um, a great place to get a lot more information. And with that, I will quit sharing screen, hopefully. Come on. Okay. Oh, stop share. There we go. And we will turn it open to the um, moderators to do Q and A. Okay, so there are quite a few questions. <laughs> Um, so there's a couple about squirrels and I know you, you kind of went over this, but some specific questions. Is there a type of bird food that is resistant to squirrels? No, plain and simple. No. Um, if it's out there, they will eat it. They have a preference for corn. They have a preference for, for sunflower seeds. Safflower seed comes as close as anything. I have seen squirrels eat some of it. Um, but that might be about it, but it's, it's not going to be squirrel resistant. Okay. So you talked about adding the, the pepper. Someone mm -hmm. wants to know how much should they add? Until they quit coming back. Um, it, it, basically, you want to be able to see it. You want to have a little bit in a bucket, dump some in, stir it up so you can kind of see the grains of red 
on on everything um, and that usually will work occasionally you'll find the squirrel that it doesn't seem to bother i've i've done it sometimes and eventually i'll see a squirrel and my bird feeder sitting there rubbing its little cheeks i mean his bird mouth rubbing its little cheeks because it, it's hot and he's drinking from the bird bath like crazy but um you just kind of stay after him you just kind of <laughs> stay after him okay sounds good and then we had a couple of people talk about raccoons at their feeders yep um so i'm guessing it's kind of similar to squirrels but do they pose any threat of disease to the birds um there there's certain diseases in wildlife that could be could be spread back and forth i i, I think specifically between raccoons and birds i have not heard of anything um i'm not going to rule anything out but it's you know it, it's more just a case of they're so destructive okay Sounds good. And then we have some questions about um, like providing the whole seed or shelled seeds. Um, what What's best, um, sunflower seeds and peanuts? Questions about that. In nature, the natural food sources are coming shelled. Um, I use the sunflower seeds and chips um, in my tube feeder. Other than that, I'm always putting out whole seeds. Some say the birds need to keep having that rough abrasive material, the bird, the, the shell of the sunflower seed um, to keep their, their beaks in shape and all. I don't know how much of that is. I, I've never seen anything that really backed that up other than people's opinions. Um, but it, it I, I just say it's going to be cheaper to use the whole seed. So use what's most cost effective for you. Okay. Um, then we have some questions about how long the feed lasts. So someone wants to know if suet will spoil or get too old. And then do you have a recommended feed that lasts the longest? Um, I have good luck with sunflower seed um, lasting for quite a while. I okay. don't know that I've ever had any actually go bad. But um, I, I, I stop you real quick. You turned into a robot. Can you unplug and unplug your, your headset real quick? Or maybe it's Cassie. No, I, th I think it's because I was hearing it on, on me too. Okay. Um, You're clear. Okay. Am I clear now? Clear. Um, the, got to think of where I was. Oh, the, the, the longevity of, of seeds. Um, I really think that sunflower seeds, most of the grains are going to last for six to 10 months. I don't believe in laying in large stores of feed. Um, I get a 40 pound, 50 pound bag of sunflower seed. When it's starting to, to run down, I go in and get some more. So I don't try to go too crazy laying in long supplies uh, of any of the seeds. Niger thistle is notorious for being short lived. In cold weather, if you can keep it on a porch, keep it somewhere that you know rodents won't get to it and, and won't have troubles like that, it will last longer. Um, but I, I just say you get a bag of seed. If you're going through that in a week, maybe get a bigger bag of seed and just start to learn how to, to schedule yourself so that you can keep it as fresh as possible. But usually most of the sunflower seeds, grains are going to last eight, 10 months in length. You can hear me, okay. How does that? Oh, it's You're, sorry. It is Cassie. Oh. How about we take a break real quick and get some questions from Franny in the chat. Chuck, I don't know if we're going to get through everything. We've got uh, like- That wouldn't surprise me. So we'll do our best. Okay. I don't, I mean, I I don't really have a lot of questions. I mean, there's, there's questions here, but they're all kind of related around what she's already asked, like, uh, you know, squirrels and- and raccoons and uh there's like one about um that their bird feed has um like spider webs in it is it still good um you know that, that type of thing okay if, if you got spider webs you've actually got indian meal moth more than likely um and and just take it all out and dump it out and get fresh the the a lot of the birds will eat the insects that are in it do not spray it with any kind of a pesticide just take it out dump it get fresh i'm just looking at some of the q and a's here um some stuff about some making their your own kind of soot peanut butter type feeds um you can you can there's 
in, in that series of backyard birding guides, I've got several recipes that of making your own suet mixtures with cornmeal, with suet, with peanut butter, with Crisco, things like that. Um, and, and that's great. You can, if you've got kids, you can take the pine cones, roll it in peanut butter and bird seeds, then hang it up where they can watch it. Um, just those sort of things. Um, so I'd say look at that. Um, Chuck, this one says, would spreading the feeders around the property create a le less concentrated area of potential for predators? Yes and no. Um, it, oh, for predators. Yes and no. Um, it, it would tend to make it, but it also, I tell people, put the feeders where you can see them most easily. It's, it's all for your, you're wanting to get them as close to your house as you can see them. So make it where it's comfortable. I think you're better off trying to put up, get more landscaping out there that will protect the birds is what I'd really recommend doing. And I'll jump in and help Cassie out um, on the Q and A section for you, Chuck. Thank um, you, Matthew. One of the questions was about putting out fruit. Do you ever put out fruit for certain types of birds? And if so, what times of the year do you do that? I do that in the spring for Orioles primarily, put out orange, oranges, orange halves. Um, a lot of, lot of controversy about grape jelly right now, but I still put out a little bit of grape jelly. I feed those for a very limited period of time in the spring. Usually Orioles are gonna to start to hit the state about the last week of April excuse me, and I will only be feeding or feeding oranges for about three or four weeks. Once they start nesting and the migrants have moved on, um, the, the locals that are nesting don't seem to be interested in my oranges anymore. Uh, Chuck, the two that I have are, um, can you say a little about making water available during winter and somebody wanted to know if you had a ground feeder, whether it should be in the open or should it be in a sheltered place? Okay, making water available in the winter, you, you need to have a feeder near an uh, electrical outlet so you can put a uh, bird bath heater in it. There's several bird bath heater models out there and they're very, very good. Um, when we hit 20 below back in February, my, my bird bath stayed open. So it's, I hope we don't see that again in my lifetime, but it may happen, but um, those are very, very good. Um, ground feeder, I'll tell you what, we've got a, um, where the front porch in our farmhouse used to be is just a slab now and the roof is still overhead. Most of my wintertime bird feeders are underneath this. And this is there when I lived in town for 30 years, I had a ground feeder that was just out back and when it snowed, I had to go off and sweep the snow off of it. So I get a lot of birds at either one. They'll, they will find it. They will absolutely find it. And along the lines of ground feeders, do you have any tips? Because there's lots of questions about kind of just best management practice for the ground feeders, and especially people are concerned about rats and raccoons and other animals getting in. Any kind of tips for them on that? No, if you start to get the raccoons or rats or mice coming in, you can always try to use a little bit of the capsation. The, the red pepper, I saw somebody saying that they'd heard that it was a problem on the respiratory. You know, there's a lot of research being done right now. Um, there are some liquid formulations that are now making basically um, cayenne pepper water to, to spray on these so you don't have so you have fewer aerosols but um, I just try to, to keep it cleaned up around there I recognize that I'm going to probably have a few rodents around as well um, if the raccoons come in you know I let them have the ground feeder and take everything else in sometimes it's just it's a balance of you know you're going to have issues you're putting out the buffet eventually something you don't like is going to come by um, usually though, I find that the barred owls around our area do a pretty good job of keeping the rodents under control. And I'll keep answering questions as long as you're asking them or until we run out of time. <laughs> One of the next ones was when using peanuts, there's a lot of different types of peanuts you can buy, shelled, whole, roasted, salted. What would be your recommendation there? Avoid roasted, avoid salted. Um, most places that are selling bird seed will have just raw peanuts. They're unsalted, unshelled, um, or I mean, unsalted, unroasted. Um, and that's why I encourage people to use. Uh, if you can put the others out and they will eat it. Um, I don't think they need the salt that much. I don't think they need them to be roasted, but if you're just getting a big bag at the local, you know, feed store of peanuts, you know, give half to the birds and half for yourself. It won't be too much of a problem. Very good. 
Um, you may not want to get down this rabbit trail, but several people have asked about light pollution and bird populations and migratory birds. Is there anything you want to throw that, out? That's a whole, you know, three hour discussion. Light pollution is real and something needs to be done about it. Um, once you get past cats, the second largest killer of birds is, is um, birds running into human structures. And that includes communication towers, skyscrapers, um, wind turbines, you know, just anything man-made put in the air, people are going to hit. Um, and there's a lot of work being done. I say, just look at that. Um, so yeah, it's, you're right. It's a rabbit hole. All right. And there's a lot of discussion that we could have on that. Um, any tips maybe for people who have problems with birds running into their windows? Is that easier to tackle? <laughs> that, that is a little bit easier to tackle. There's a lot of research being done right now. Birds see into the infrared and ultraviolet. So they see things that we don't. And there's a lot of work being done on giant, um, giant highlighters, if you will, that are virtually invisible to us, but they're just a glowing neon light to the birds. One thing you can also do is move bird feeders closer to the windows so they don't have a chance to develop quite so much speed when they hit them. Um, if then people, a lot of people say within three feet, you can put, you can put things on the outside. Um, there's some real interesting research about running very thin white lines up and down on the, um, with, with white paint on your windows and the birds, the birds will see that and avoid it. You don't want them to go horizontal because the birds will try to fly through those, but up and down, they see it and it seems to work. So there's a lot of research being, being done right now. The, the thin white paint on the window seems to work. Um, I've known people that have just put up netting outside. So when they hit it, they just kind of bounce off. So it, it is a problem though. Somebody asked if you could say again how you diagnose that you have salmonella in your birds, like, or if Con you can Okay, yeah, conjunctivitis, you can see the crustiness on the outside of the, of the eyes. With salmonella, and it's primarily going to be goldfinches and, and pine siskins, you just either find them dead without the crustiness on the eyes, or they're, they're just around and they're not acting right. They're not flying away. They're just sitting on the feeder all day long. Those are usually good symptoms of salmonella. I shouldn't say good symptoms, but but pretty reliable symptoms. Diagnostic symptoms. Di there you go. Diagnostic symptoms. Yep. There was also a question about during bird migrations, if feeding the birds is more important or less important, if it detracts from the migration or maybe helps their migration. <laughs> um, if I if I had the answer to whether it helps or detracts, I'd be a rich man right now. But um, birds migrate based on weather presence and absence of food doesn't have a lot of impact on that. Uh, in the spring, when birds are going north, they will keep going. They'll, they'll migrate at night. They'll land during the day. They'll feed. They refuel. They'll keep going north until the wind sw switches and comes from the north. And then they'll fall out for a few days until the wind switches back to the south. So having food available um, actually does, I think it probably would help. And it gives us a better opportunity to see some of these birds in migration. Very good. Um, a couple people asked about um, during wet weather, sometimes bird seed gets wet in the feeders. Sometimes it starts to grow or germinate. Yep. Is that still okay for the birds to eat or what should be done in those scenarios? If it's raining and it's going to be raining for a week, just don't worry about it. But when it finally does stop raining, dump it out, let the feeders dry out and fill them back up. Germinating seed isn't going to hurt them. Not going to hurt them at all. They can eat the sprouts just like we can. Very good. Well, there are still tons and tons of questions that we could get to here, but we've reached the, the one o'clock hour. I would encourage uh, people to, to send me an email of that cotte at ksu.edu. If you didn't get your question answered, I'll be more than happy to answer it for you. All right. Well, thank you, Chuck. That was a wonderful presentation as always. And I learned something new every time I listen to your presentations. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for this K-State Garden Hour. We are glad you were here today to learn about embracing your landscape wild side and hopefully you learned something about um, how to help our furry friends. Um, our final session for the 2021 series will be on November 3rd. That will be our final one for this year. Um, please join us to learn about the winter interest in the landscape. Be sure to visit the K-State Garden Hour website to see all of the topics that we've talked about before, as well as upcoming topics for the 2022 series will be posted there when they're finalized. Once again, this series, this session was recorded and will be posted by tomorrow afternoon. 
After the webinar ends today, you will receive a prompt to take an evaluation survey. Please fill this out as we would greatly appreciate your feedback. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at gardenhour at ksu.edu. Once again, thank you for joining us and we hope you join us for our final 2021 session on November 3rd.